great white poor beagle and a couple of other species. Now whether these were attached to garments, we don't know. Could have been necklaces, who knows, because all we have are the enamel caps. These strange cylindrical objects are made of swordfish sword. Now there were swordfish hunters and they used the, the, the picture of swordfish. You'll see pictures in a minute, but they have that big massive bony build, rostrum they call it, sticking out the front of their maxilla. And uh, it's a beautiful piece of raw material. It's like a big huge slab of bone. And so they used it to make these cylindrical objects and we weren't sure for a long time what they were, but we're now pretty convinced that they're four shafts. And there's a little cartoon under them that shows what a four shaft might look like. Um, if you're gonna be hunting, large animals, often the wood itself isn't really tough enough, or is the hunter judges it not to be tough enough. And so they'll put a, a four shaft of bone or ivory on the end, and then they'll drill a hole in that and arm, the, put the little harpoon in the hole. So I think these are four shafts made of swordfish sword, probably for hunting swordfish. This is a piece of mica. Mica is something that occurs in a lot of red paint cemeteries. And this brings in another thread, and that is shamanism. Their religious specialists were called shamans, and shamans' job is to deal with, uh, just like our clergy, to deal with the supernatural dimension that most of us are not really competent to deal with. All right, so in hunter-gatherer societies, there are people who we might judge to be emotionally disturbed, they might have hallucinations in our, in our terminology, but these are termed to be gifts in many hunter-gatherer societies, and these people become the shamans, and they go on, trans they, they, they go on uh, journeys, they go physically on journeys, long distances. They go on spiritual journeys when they transform themselves into birds or some other animal. And they often are, they have a little kit of what's called a shaman's bundle. In many societies, there are many of these things that survive historically, particularly out in the plains area. But we found them archaeologically here too. And they're just the odds and ends, pieces of equipment that shamans acquire and keep around them to perform their their functions, and mica is something that's very popular with shamans. One of the, pro one of the properties shamans have, as a recent anthropologist put it, is they can see into, they can see through, and they can see beyond. They have visual powers. And so things like mica, um, after Europeans showed up, glass beads, uh, crystals, these are things that shamans are fascinated with. And this is, this, we don't find mica in the village sites. Once again, we find mica in the burials, probably shamans' burials. These are the real famous artifacts of the red paint people, these long slate bayonets. They come in four styles, basically. Um, these are long, narrow, hexagonal bayonet, bayonets. We call them bayonets. They're, I don't think they're utilitarian. They're far too delicate. Um, they're made of locally, I think it's local slate. It's, it's hard to source slate, but I think they're made of local slate. It's Monson area, something like that. And they're ground very precisely. Now, there are other people in the world who make longish slate points and they're often utilitarian, but these are the most beautifully, precisely executed, highest level of design, highest level of execution, most extreme form to the point where I don't think they could have been functional. Now these are uh, famous worldwide. Any artifact collector instantly from, God, Ukraine would know what these are. This is the longest one, it's over 18 inches. Now some of these were decorated as well. There's a person from New Brunswick in the audience, I don't see him, but anyway, these came from Cow Point, which is the easternmost red paint cemetery, one of only two east of the main border. There's one in St. John's, uh, St. John, and there's one up uh, on Cow Point. And uh, these were engraved in a similar manner to those bone daggers, this time in stone. This is not easy, it's very precisely done. Now there's a second style, and this is uh, an odd style, it's a, much less elaborately shaped, but there's a ridge down one side and the other side has no ridge. And they often have a tip, the, 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 uh, I'm sorry, the base has an odd little facet ground on it. Now, once again, these are not of, they're often, the best specimens are not of local stone. They are of a banded slate and we don't have banded slate in Maine, but there's a lot of banded slate in, let's say the Ohio area, Eastern Great Lakes. And they made all kinds of things out of banded slate. And as a matter of fact, there are a lot of these bayonets found in Ohio. So I'm pretty sure these bayonets were made 
in Ohio. Now the problem is in Ohio they're found singly, one at a time. We've never found a cache of them. We've never found a cemetery. So we don't know who made them. We don't know why. But th we think that's where they come from. And these folks from Maine, these swordfish hunters, they're reaching out somehow to the Midwest and pulling these things in so they could use them in their cemetery or their mortuary rituals. And perhaps other rituals as well. They wind up in cemeteries. We don't see them in village sites. This is another local style. These are small. They could have been functional. You can see how th th that's a centimeter scale. Two and a half of those would be about an inch, two and a half of those squares. So they could have been functional. And we do find these in village sites as well, but they also occur in burials. And then there's this final style here. These are often also, sorry, also made abandoned slate. And these are also found around the eastern Great Lakes. And again, always scattered, one at a time. So we really can't, we can't pin them down in that geographic context, but the folks, the swordfish hunters are reaching out there and somehow getting them uh, back to, for use in their own ritual context. Okay, projectile points. These are the kinds of projectile points that the red paint people slash Moorhead phase made. And they're the one artifact class that they didn't embellish very much. They're functional, they're sharp, they're thick, they're rugged, they're pointy, but they're not beautiful. But, uh, and they're found abundantly in villages and burials. But there are other projectile points in the cemeteries that are very, very different. These are of two materials. The top three are quartzite, the bottom three are chert. And I recognize the form. I was trained originally in New York, and this is what we would call in the New York context a Norman skill point. So they're at home in the Champlain Valley. The materials are uh, on the top row of the materials, that's Cheshire Quartzite from Lake Champlain, and below that is Fort Ann Shirt from Lake George. So you can see the pin that shows Fort Ann Shirt and Lake Champlain, of course, is up off the map above that. Both those lakes are, lie in the same trough of bedrock. And this is another uh, class of artifacts that uh, we find in the cemeteries, never in the villages. And this is a raw material that comes from an either far, farther away source. It's a, we call it Rama Chert, and it's from Rama Bay on the North Labrador coast, a thousand miles away. That pin you can see at the north, that's, that's Rama Bay. That raw material occurs on the top of one mountain in the world, in Rama Bay. How any human being ever found it, I don't know. What would have motivated them to climb to the top of this godforsaken mountain mm -hmm. on the north coast of Labrador? But once they did, it's a beautiful, it's visually beautiful, it works beautifully. And uh, the rabbit shirt points come all the way down the Labrador coast. They turn the corner and go up to St. Lawrence to north of Anticosti Island, more or less, a little farther west than that. So I don't think that the red pay people had to go all the way to Rabba Bay to get the points, but they had at least to go to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Okay, so I have been working on these red paint cemeteries all during my graduate career. And you can learn a lot from cemeteries, but you know, mortuary ritual is a little tiny slice of human existence. And I knew that I, if I wanted to really understand who was making these wonderful artifacts in these big cemeteries, I had to find a village site. And I really, really lucked out. I went all up and down the main coast in 68, 69, looking for early sites. I couldn't find any. And I still don't quite understand why, but I, just as a Hail Mary pass, I took uh, the ferry to North Haven. Yeah, I meant to go to Vinyl Haven, I missed the ferry. So the next, the next day, the, I met a couple of local folks that became my dear friends, and they just took me all around the island, and they showed me where all the sites were, because these coastal sites are all eroding, and so the, the shells are tumbling down the banks, so all the local folks know where the shell middens are. So this is the Turner Farm site. It's now owned by Shelley Pinger and Don Sussman, um, and it's a big, deep shell midden. It's, and I, the minute I saw it, I said, oh, yeah, this is it. And we did a trench in 1971, and we instantly, at the bottom of the shell midden, found what we were looking for, a village of the red paint people. Mm. And you can see we love shell middens for a couple of reasons. One is they're stratified. And here you can kind of see the layering effect, that dark streak that kind of runs down that wall. That's a gravel floor for a house. And so you can sort of get the sense that these are layered. That means that the artifacts left by different people are all kind of sorted out by layer. So they're not mixed up together. And uh, you know, why was it so hard for me to find sites? Well, it's because they're all washing away. Dan Belknap teaches geology at Orono, and he worked with me on this site, and he developed this little model that shows what happens when a site is, oh, let's say five feet above uh, the high tide, 
When the storms come, it attacks the bank. The bank erodes, the shells tumble down the bank. If, if the site runs down a slope to get near the water, then the beach builds up over the site. So these sites are going away. They're either being covered up or eroded away. And um, you know these sites are 4,000 years old, and sea level has risen quite a bit in 4,000 years. So these sites, I think the Turner Farm is the, I think it might be the earliest dated coastal archaeological site maybe on the Atlantic coast. We really got lucky to find this. There are a few others that are were comparable, uh, usually more eroded, usually less stratified. So I just lucked into it big time at the Turner Farm site. Now, once we started working in the Shellman, we began to realize, we talked to biologists all the time, we began to realize that the, the hard tissue in a lot of these organisms records the environmental history and, and their own lives in their hard tissue. So just as an example, because you can do it with teeth and fish bone and all kinds of different hard tissues, but this is a clam shell. And you can see it grows annual layers. And uh, w the first thing we wanted to know was when are they harvesting clams? And we, we looked at the state of, the, of growth of the last layer and compared it to previous layers to kind of get an average of what a layer thickness was. And we could sort of get within three months of the harvest season. So that was great. But then we realized that, um, that there are carbon and, and uh, oxygen isotopes in the shell that will record salinity and temperature. So right now, that's, that's the research we're currently engaged in. We're trying to measure the salinity and temperature of the penobscot Bay system through history, through prehistory, using archaeological shells. So there's a lot of information. So when I went to the Turner Farm site, my presumption was that it was a summer fishing camp. And um, because we, that's how we use the coast, we go to the coast in the summer to relax and to fish. And we thought the Indians did the same thing. But when we did these seasonal uh, acquisition analyses for all these species, and there are other ways to do it. Uh, and a deer, a deer skull with a shed antler tells you what season the deer was killed. The presence of a migratory species like certain birds tells you, you know, they're here at a certain season. So if they're in the, if they're in the bone collection from a site, you know that they were taken during that season. So here's a whole range of species that they were using. And if you, uh, the heavy lines indicate periods of heavy use, the lighter lines and so forth indicate, you know, a little bit more equivocal use. But the, the basic pattern is we were dead wrong about it being a summer site. It was a year round site. And if there was a thin spot in the occupation, it was in the summer. So, you know, that completely changed our minds about how these folks are using the coast. They're living on the coast. Now, most of the cemeteries are not on the coast. They're not far inland, but they're inland. And so we, we still are a little puzzled by that, but we, we do know there were cemeteries on the coast, and we think most of them have just washed away, like most of the sites of that age. So these are coastal people. They made, they made trips for salmon fishing, shad fishing, alewife fishing into the interior in season. But generally speaking, they hung right close to the coast. Now, what were they subsisting on? Well, we found bones that we sort of recognized, but they were too big. So we found these big circular vertebrae, you know, size of a quarter, half dollar. And I said, geez, those look like cod. But, you know, they're too big, because this is what we think of as a cod. You know, it's maybe 18, 20 inches long. And then I realized, these are the kind of cod that these guys were catching. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a shot actually from Labrador, where a few of these giants survived into the photographic era. But they were eradicated probably by that time in the Gulf of Maine. We've never seen a picture of a cod this size from the Gulf of Maine. But this is the cod they, they had available. Uh, it's a, just an, an indicator of how badly we have treated the marine ecosystem of the Gulf of Maine. We've not only virtually eradicated them, we've dwarfed them. But anyway, so this is a kind of resource they had available. And then, of course, we found a lot of swordfish sword. Well, we knew that they had, from previous work, we knew that they made artifacts of swordfish sword. But we had no idea that they actually hunted them. We thought they might have traded them, oh, let's say, from Martha's Vineyard or someplace. But no, um, we found a lot of swordfish sword. So here's just a picture of a swordfish. And we'll talk more about swordfish in a minute. They were big, big swordfish, just like the cod. That's not a matter of ecological change. The swordfish that came into the Gulf of Maine are the big females. There's, sexual dimorphism means, dimorphism means one, one sex is bigger than the other. And in mammals, it's usually the males that are bigger. But in fish, it's often the females that are bigger. And the big females come into the Gulf of Maine. They live in the Gulf Stream most of the year. In the summer, they come into the Gulf of Maine to fish. And it's usually the big females. 
So I'm not sure if that's Zane Gray or not, but he was crazy for having big swordfish. They're very, very powerful, very swift swimming fish. Um, quite dangerous to hunt because they attack boats, especially if the boats are attacking them. And there's a huge literature of people who have been, uh, about fishermen who have been injured, even killed by swordfish attacking their vessels. Here are some artifacts made of swordfish sword. And I think these may be the prototypes for those long daggers. They have hexagonal cross sections. And these probably were functional tools. So maybe those slate bayonets were sort of a ceremonial, exaggerated form of a functional lance that could have been used for marine hunting. OK, back to shamanism. Uh, we found no red paint burials at the Turner Farm site, uh, but we did find dog burials, and they were sometimes, or actually mostly, in red ochre. So these were ceremonial burials of dogs. And here's, a, here's one such burial. He's in pretty bad shape because he was down below the shell, and the skeleton wasn't well preserved. The skull is in the lower right there. And right next to it, we found this odd concatenation of artifacts. It, it, some of them are functional, some of them are not. Um, some of them are broken. It's a very odd. They're right in a tight little cluster. And I think this is a shaman's bundle. So I, I have a feeling we're dealing with a shamanistic, maybe the shaman's dog died. I don't know. Or maybe the shaman performed a ritual over this dog that was highly regarded by its owner. And these artifacts were, were left right next to the burial. OK, now archaeologists um, are still today trained to explain cultural change, prehistoric cultural change, in terms of environmental change. In other words, if the environment changes, cultures have to adapt to the environment. And that's the mechanism that most archaeologists invoke to explain how culture A turned into culture B. So we have to look at the environment. Um, let's take a look at the Gulf of Maine. This is a sea level curve for the Gulf of Maine. At the left is that high, the highest shorelines. This represents a point, this is, the, this is relative sea level, land versus local land versus local sea only. We're not talking worldwide sea levels, all right? So the glaciers are over two miles thick on the main coast. They press down the crust of the earth, and then they quickly melt, and the water rushes in. So in terms of where we're standing now, back then, 13,000 years ago, we would have been under maybe over 200 feet of water, I think the figures are for here. But then the land pops back up, and sea level dropped like a stone till it went down uh, about 65 feet below, uh, or that's it meters, I forget. At least 65 meters. It went way, way down. And then the rebound of the land stopped. And at that point, the tectonic plate on which we sit began to tilt, so sea level started back up again. And it's been coming up ever since. Very quickly at first, here, and then in a couple of phases more slowly. So that one point to make here is that um, around 4,000 years ago, take that as the medium date for the red paint people, it's down, you know, three, four meters below present level. So that would have changed the coastline, and it means that a lot of coastline has washed away since. But more importantly, this is an aerial view of the bathymetry of the Gulf of Maine, and it's an odd body of water. The oceanic tides enter through the northwest channel here, and then the spin of the earth forces the water um, eastward. And it, it sloshes up into the Bay of Fundy where you get these immense tides. And then the tides ricochet back down. is a sort of a counterclockwise gyre. And they ricochet and they come down the coast. And you know, in this part of the world, they're what, 9, 11 and a half feet. By the time you get down to Boston, they're, they're more moderate. And Here's a diagram of the currents today. What that does is it mixes deep. Some of the water that comes into the Gulf is deep and nutrient rich. It comes from Labrador. And deep, cold waters are nutrient rich. That's just the way the ocean works. So they come down, they get sloshed into the Gulf. And then this, this tidal mixture sort of reaches down and takes these nutrient rich waters, brings them to the surface where the nutrients can be impacted by light, which causes a plankton bloom, which is the basis of a re really rich food chain. So. The tidal mixture is critical to making the Gulf of Maine what was originally a rather dead semi-inland sea into the biologically rich area that it is today. The question is, when did that happen? Oh, this is a satellite false color photograph showing chlorophyll, which is actually green. It's showing it as red. And these are plankton blooms. 
phytoplankton, plant plankton, which are eaten by zooplankton, little animals, which are eaten by fish and on up the food chain. So you can see how, how massive the plankton blooms can be in the Gulf of Maine region. Now, how do the swordfish get to the Gulf of Maine? They live in the Gulf Stream. Um, but the Gulf Stream doesn't come anywhere near the Gulf of Maine. So here's the Gulf Stream. It's sort of like a meandering river. And the way meandering rivers once in a while do, the meander gets deeper and deeper, and then suddenly you get cut off. Then it becomes an oxbow lake, right? The Connecticut River. So a similar thing happens in the Gulf Stream. These gyres, th then they break off and, they, and they, they spiral. They become what they call core rings. And the core rings drift up toward George's bank. And once they hit the bank, they break into streamers. And a warm spurt of water will come into the Gulf. And we think that's how swordfish came into the Gulf of Maine, because they, they certainly wouldn't have been comfortable in the waters between George's Bank and the Gulf Stream. So getting back to swordfish, um, they come in, they dive deep into cold water. Um, they're somewhat adapted to it. They have a mechanism in their heads that allows their eyes to be heated with blood. Now, some sharks and some tunas have the whole body. It can adjust its temperature the way we can. But the swordfish is just the eye. So they dive deep, they slash or feed. We're not entirely sure how they do it. We think they slash damage in, in animals and then gobble them up. But they get tired and cold doing that, so they come to the surface. And hunting them is not that difficult. Whoops, am I going, am I going the wrong way? Yep. They come to the surface and their fins stick out of the water. It's called finning. And they're torpid. They're tired. They're warming up. They're full. 